<laughs> Tuesday evening. So where's everyone at right now? Well, I'm currently in Brampton. Okay. Um, yeah, I'm in I'm in Ottawa at my sister's house right now. I'm in, um, I'm in Lloydminster on the border of yeah. Alberta and Saskatchewan. So you said Alberta. Well, no, but it's I just claim <laughs> Alberta, but it's on the border. <laughs> okay. Did you mean like where we're at, like how we feel about the current situation though? No, I was asking geographically, but my oh, okay, next question okay. was, yeah, how is everybody? Where yeah. is everyone at? <laughs> um i feel like a lot of us there i feel like there's kind of like almost like two groups or two emotions in everyone like everyone's either like obviously everything's really tragic it's a little traumatic for people to keep re really seeing this and also i find it very frustrating a lot of people um i'm kind of on that side the more angry frustrated because for i feel like a lot of us this is common sense this is an everyday experience mm -hmm. this is not like i feel like too it's very dis and genuine for a lot of people to be like oh like where did this come from when George we've been asking for this since before Trayvon Martin but Trayvon Martin was like the first social media one I feel like that people actually pay attention to that was in 2014 2013 well, that was time ago. So, yeah that was what seven years ago so it's just I find it um it's frustrating feeling like you're the educator and like these are common issues and fighting with people just ask like we're just asking for human rights we're asking to be considered literally a person mm -hmm. and then people have a comment to that so that's annoying and then i feel like on the other hand people are just it's a little bit um depressing just mm -hmm. seeing the, this message over and over yeah for me i'm more so like on the hopeful side of things like like sid already said like it's kind of it's sad to see that people are just seeing this now but at the same time with the like outpouring support from like so many corporations um and like so many people are just like being educated now and seeing kind of like more of just our struggle now and being really educated. So it's, it's making me very hopeful for the future. Yeah. And honestly, like the more I think about it, like the more you kind of realize that there's so much going on right now. And like at first, obviously it was like, we we're all angry that this was still going on. But um, now I feel like it's like a mix of like being hopeful and being like kind of like perceptive at the same time, just cause like mm -hmm. it's a very weird time we're in where, you know, brands are posting about like supporting black businesses and like everyone's like on this huge bandwagon and people are like all just like care about black people so much out of nowhere mm -hmm. and although it's like you know all fun and dandy because you know like to bring an awareness at the same time it's kind of like the like you have to kind of question at the same time like how genuine it is mm -hmm. and like how much like of like how much support is really like going towards us rather than just like being like you know, saving face for their, themselves, you know what I mean? So it's a little bit confusing, not gonna lie. It's, it's, it's confusing for like a lot of black people, I feel. Yeah. yeah there's even um, an Instagram right now called uh, Pop, Pop Out or like Stop It, basically, pull I think up, it's the name. Yeah. yeah, Pull Up or Shut Up. Yeah. And it's literally asking these brands, okay, you're gonna post, now show us your executives and your CEOs, how many people of color, black people especially are on your teams. Mm -hmm. And it's been absolutely eye-opening. For me, I knew the brands though. I already, they already, I already knew they had certain people on their teams. You can tell. And then obviously brands like Chanel and L'Oreal and stuff like that, they had zero. Mm -hmm. So oh, yeah. it, they're basically saying if these brands are speaking out, don't buy from these brands for at least 24 hours. They say 70, 72 or 76, I'm out of math, um, for three days. And they said, ask these brands to put out a list of who they're employed or who's employing the, or they have like as employees. And then if they have, if they say they're working towards it, it's just to be transparent with their customers. Because if you have a huge, um, for instance, like Cantu is a black hair company that we all use. However, um, the owner is a white man. So, and his entire team is white. Mm -hmm. So it's like, it's, or African Pride. There's a brand called African Pride. Mm -hmm. And you're like, oh, that sounds like so, you know, black owned. It's not. It's owned by a, a white French guy. So it's kind of interesting to see there is definitely companies that capitalize off of the black market as black, black Americans are actually the highest spenders in the United States in terms of uh, consumer goods. So they, they, they definitely capitalize off that. So it's very like, we don't like um, want to see that fake allyship or you know, we want to actually see people who are actually employing people and really supporting the movement. So it's nice to see like those initiatives out there as well. 
Yeah, to, to be completely honest, like I'd rather see like the CEOs, like mm-hmm. like um who was it um Ohanan. the Amazon guy Jeff Bezos. I'd rather see like personal responses from CEOs saying like yo like Heike like this is real and I'm actually trying to like help the situation than hearing some next HR brand written statement true, yeah. released for like just for people pleasing. Do you know what I mean? Like let the check be written, let the numbers speak. Do you know what I mean? Let us actually see that you really are taking steps towards you know making that change rather than just like the random like oh yeah like black square people like black lives matter or whatever because honestly like mm-hmm. at first it was cool to see everyone's kind of jumping on board but now it's like okay like now we need to actually see like like action speak rather than just you know your random words because we're not idiots anymore like we're not like yeah. just gonna follow these like everyone's everyone's really peeping the brands they follow and where they're putting their money because they know that like right now is when we're actually in a position where we can actually like you know hold them accountable to make sure they're actually doing what they need to be doing rather than just telling us like oh yeah like we care because like I don't care that you care. Do you know what I mean? I care that like you're actually doing something to make sure that like we're actually like, you know, seeing what needs to be done, you know? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And um, another thing that's been not eye opening, but just sort of like something that's been hitting me is how many people are just like, I'm so shocked. Like, I can't believe this is, I had no idea. It's like, really? You know? Honestly, you can't really blame them though, because like even for my mom, like she's African, right? And she literally came downstairs this morning, like after watching George Floyd's funeral, I think. And she was like, even for her, she never understood how deep systematic racism was. And she found out that like, there's a lot of African Americans living in you know the States that have last names like Smith, Robinson, Williamson, whatever, right? And it never yeah. dawned on her that those last names aren't their actual last names, right? Mm-hmm. And like, just that representation of like how deeply rooted it is, not everyone's gonna realize do you know what i mean i got to realize it because i grew up in like this place is like an or like a, an african african-american right mm-hmm. but if you grow up white it doesn't cross your mind at all do you know what i mean and you know as much as you try to act like you're a good person you can't blame the ignorance that just exists it was so widespread and so like blanketed that mm-hmm. everyone for the most part who actually does care about this is genuinely like shook like a genuine just like it's crazy mm. Yeah, what what actually obsessed me the most about this stuff is what it had to take to get this uproar. And it's like, so we have to be on video, being killed on video, like a blatant act of police brutality to even get people to care. And still there are people that are bringing up his criminal history. I did, I posted on my Instagram. Mm -hmm. Um, Google search his name, George Floyd. The first three things are his criminal history, career criminal, um, you don't even see his death or funeral until you get to the bottom. So it's like people, it's like, what is it going to take? Like, and even when I hear these um, police officers and, and special investigation units be like, we have to investigate the video. What are you investigating? Right, yeah. It's right, right there. Yeah. Yeah. And it's just so crazy to me. Or in Seattle, the KKK um, admitted man who decided to run his car into protesters shot someone and then had the ability to walk up to the police and get handcuffed and put away. Like, right. it's just like, how many, like, how, what is it going to take for people to just, like, wake up? That's what's really upsetting mm. for me is, do we have to be perfect citizens? Because we've had them, um, you know, Breonna Taylor, EMT, perfect citizen, inside her house sleeping. The guy they were looking for was already in jail. Her boyfriend, stand his ground, because that's a lo- the law they love to use, Right shoots the police because people are coming to his house guns blaring it's an intruder they were not even announced like they weren't even in uniform no knock warrants they weren't even in uniform a lot of sand no no knock warrants that's what they do and they're banning it now and thank god for her name in that state a lot of states don't have it for that exact reason Mm -hmm. i've seen some um officers in georgia they literally um this guy was sitting down with his dog they blasted the door with a grenade his front door there could have been a child there you don't know who's in his house his dog got thrown across the room looking for drugs he didn't even have so it's just for me that's the most um upsetting part is like i don't i want people to care when it's not on video when they are criminals because you know what even if they are a criminal they deserve to be properly taken care of they deserve the correct um like path to injustice toward the court. They they deserve to be able to go through that process. They shouldn't be brutalized at the beginning. And they're still human. That's why I don't understand why people are like, oh, mm-hmm. well, he he um talked to he talked to a minor when he was 12. Doesn't matter. Mm-hmm. Like he's still there's also there's also but there's also but like a black man died, but 
a like white person would like stole or whatever or, or but it's always like a an and There's reason to add right. to like whatever tragedy ends up happening or whatever like horrific like event ends up happening there's always like an excuse do you know what i mean mm-hmm. it's messed up and even on top of the fact like of what's going on i feel like a, a lot of the reason why people are like really shook and like you know finding this out for the first time is because like in my opinion or from what i've seen there's a lot of information that gets hidden all the time do you know what mm-hmm. i mean these events happen like months ago oftentimes years ago and we find out like literally like when it's already the case is already closed like Brandon taylor's case was fully closed closed that's insane Mm-hmm. Do you know what I mean? And now, right now. and now there's a new like like law being put in place, like dedicated to what happened to her. But the case was closed. Do you know what I mean? Like there's a lot of a lot of withholding information that's going on. It's like, in my opinion, like fully criminal. Do you mm-hmm. know what I mean? Mm-hmm. To have situations like this happen, close the case, and everyone's fine with thing can sleep at night, and it be allowed to go on in the society we live today is beyond like mind blowing. Like the things mm-hmm. that I've that's realized true. about the way some of these like systems work, like the like the court systems, the policing institutions, all that stuff. Like, no wonder people want to disband the, the police, the police force. You mm-hmm. can't trust any of it anymore. Mm-hmm. <laughs> they'll, they'll, they'll close the entire case where a woman was shot for no reason, killed, died, mm-hmm. right, and then move on with their day as if well, nothing the, happened. Yeah, and, and I, I talk I, about investigations, investigations, and even on Twitter last night, I saw this thing about Derek Chavon. I don't think they arrested the right guy. If you guys, I've been hearing people say things like that. I don't think it's the right guy. It doesn't make any sense. It first started off with his hairline, and then if you look at his side profile, his ear matches with his eye. The original video, but the person they arrested, their ear is way. It's it's so. (laughs) I don't think it's the same person. So there's something deeper, deeper going on. I don't know. It's like a deeper. There's a lot going on. Yeah. Yeah. Super shady. Yeah. Like in this day and age, I truly would not be surprised if it wasn't him. Yeah. I just wouldn't, I wouldn't even like. Oh, they've, they've, they've had cover ups. Like if you look into the history of, you know, I, I don't even know so much about Canada's history, but just in the US and like, we're not that far off from the US, you know what I mean? Historically, culturally, what have you, but. If anything, we're behind. We don't have body cameras yet. <laughs> yeah. yeah and, and the other thing that doesn't make sense is like, I, I think it's really important to have these issues um confronted through a policy level like you know banning chokeholds and banning um um you know not having a search warrant before you bust into a house but time and time again the police com- flagrantly break those rules and break those bans and still go ahead and do whatever they want to do um and they don't uh, it takes a worldwide massive march to happen for for these policymakers to actually think okay let's do something Uh um probably not because they're motivated by the same thing that the movement is motivated by but more so because they're worried about property damages they're worried about people you know not voting certain people in office etc etc yeah no it's absolutely crazy and if you look at the history you're totally right it needs to be done on a systemic um policy level because Police in the United States, their police unions argue for them like crazy. Mm-hmm. In a lot of states, you can't even sue the police. There's a law. So um, you can't sue the police officer. So who would care if I go do something, you just sue my department. I don't care. I'm not personally responsible. They're right. not held accountable. People who are held accountable are ostracized. I've, I have just saw a video today of an ex-Marine saying he uses his um, training from Afghanistan to destabilize um, and de-escalate situations. And he spoke out saying that he feels like his uh, his area needs more training on de-escalation. He got fired and he was told, you need to take down the video, apologize to your coworkers or we're firing you. Mm-hmm. And he refused. He's like, that's just wrong. I've seen posts, which I completely agree with thinking about it. A lawyer needs what, seven years yeah. to directly learn the law. An esthetician needs two years to cut your toenails. So why do police have six months of training and then they're put out on the road? They have no racial bias training for the most part. They have no de-escalation training. Um, It's all in the policies and screenings. I believe we need more um, more frequent, more than just when you hire these people. Um, We need to really honestly also defund the police. I believe in that Um, because even with the case of Regis in Toronto, um, the police should not be called for that. Canada, in Canada, we have the Canadian Mental Health, right, center, 
they have people that you can call and they'll bring on um, two caseworkers to the house. Um, unfortunately, not a lot of people know that, mm -hmm. but those people should have been there, not the police. Police are not trained to handle, they're mm -hmm. not psychologists, you mm -hmm. know, they're not trained to handle these cases. So when people say defund the police, I completely agree. When we put those into community resources, right? Because why do people commit crime? You commit crime when you're not able to fulfill your basic needs. Mm -hmm. And that's why in impoverished areas, you see a rise in crime, right? So when you give those um, uh, community services and social services, you will see the crime rate actually drop because when people are able to fulfill their basic needs, they don't need to go loot, steal, sell drugs to make, make ends meet, right? Sell, them, sell their bodies, that type of stuff. You don't need to see that. And then the police don't need to be called. Mm -hmm. So I think we just need a society mind switch. And I think people are starting to wake up to the reality that you don't just need to believe these people because they're in these certain positions. And they also, I think people are seeing that the power of a community, right? You know, we had the Amish coming out, even. Yeah, and, you yeah. know, Anonymous come out from six years, you know, yeah. the famous hacking group, activist group, come out to speak about it. So we, ha we actually had to have all these people come out just to get three officers arrested, which I found yeah. extremely crazy. Mm -hmm. But if that's what it's going to take, I was super proud to see the Amish come out. Those people don't even have to No facts. So like it, just, it, just shows, it just shows how much, like, work has to go to get us where we need to be. Because, like, if mm -hmm. you really think about it, like, there's so many problems when it comes to racial inequality in, like, both the states and, like, around the world that our first step being police brutality is so blatant and so, like, aggressively obvious. Mm -hmm. And it's, like, now just being dealt with let alone getting to all the economic issues we have, oh, right? I mean, all the political healthcare. issues we have, mm -hmm. all the social morality okay. issues around like, yeah. like racism. Like, and it's like, we're now just starting to tackle the obvious ones, the physical aggressive right. forces that are literally killing us. Do you know mm -hmm. what I mean? How long is it gonna take us to finally get to like the wealth gap being finally closed and like people are actually just, you know, able to build wealth regardless of what skin color they are. How long is it gonna take for people to actually be able to like do the things that we've never been able to do for like hundreds of years. Do you know what I mean? Like, it's it's crazy that like it's it's taken this much time for the entire world to kind of just like focus for one minute like for one brief second and be like like this is this is a serious problem going on and it's so mm -hmm. deeply rooted and it's, it's like it's woven into every single thing that we do every single thing that we touch you know what i mean like on the fact that like we don't even know at this point what to even do with ourselves when it comes to like being in situations like that because it's so messy like the whole thing's a mess i can't like the healthcare <laughs> system is completely defunded you know I mean, like not defunded, but it has like there's nothing in it, right? The police force is so overly Over funded that yeah. people are able like there's just tanks lying around for like just random police to use. Right. You know, right. Like, it's, like six months of training and I can drive a tank for no reason, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yet they can't they can't invest in educating these officers. Do you know what I mean? Can invest in friggin' the proper um like infrastructure to make sure that like things like this doesn't happen. Like there's no checks, there's no audits. You just you just give people power and they just run around and do whatever they want. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? I don't know if I personally believe that community police, not community police, policing, but like um, policing by like, like random pedestrians, or whatever is the right idea. But I do know that like starting from the beginning with every single institution that exists in these countries needs to happen, especially sooner than later. Do you know what I mean? That's why mm -hmm. I, I respect like, you know, institutions like even Western reaching out and saying like, yeah, we're going to start like refixing all these issues one by one. Cause like that needs to happen sooner than later. And like, it's taken too long, but like, it needs to just, it needs to just happen. Like, it's crazy the kind of world that we live in. We really take it in sometimes. So um, speaking about Western, I wanted to ask you guys about that letter that you guys had put out on Instagram. <laughs> uh, so let's just go with it kind of point by point by point, because there was a lot in there um, that I think it'd be great to even have more follow-up sessions with with the BSA yeah. to see where the school is at in terms of fulfilling all those things that you called for. Um, but let's just get into it. So uh, from what Angie, you told me, um, President Alan Shepard got in contact with you guys first and yeah. said, we want to do something. Well, so what happened? Know. Basically. So last year there was this whole um, thing that happened with this um, professor calling saying the n-word in class yeah. and that spurred so much uproar from the black students and even other students at our school yeah. and from that the president started this thing called an anti-racism working group 
which in which he got a lot of students to talk about their racist experience on campus on campus. So with that, he was supposed to release a report um, earlier this year, but it just failed to be released as soon as we wanted it to be. So with everything that's going on with the George Floyd and the Ahmed Aubrey and Breonna Taylor, BSA decided to put out a video. And um, we put out the video and the video actually went viral. We have almost 20,000 views. And because of that, we got a lot of um, like public, the public really came to talk to us like, oh my gosh, this is happening. That's when people like were, their eyes were open to things. So um, we, I actually reached out to the USC president, Matt Reeser, to talk kind of more about what the USC could do with that. And because we reached out to the USC, um, we started getting more traction from like the, the upper Western um, admin. And that's when Ladan, who is the new equity and diversity um, officer, reached out to us. And that's when she was the one who recommended that we talk to Alan. We sent him an email. So all the posts that you saw, that was what we sent to Alan. And then after we sent that post, he reached out to us. Mm. So, yeah. Um, okay. Yeah. So when he, so when, when um, the president of Western initially reached out to you after what had happened last year in the classroom, um, who was a part, of, I'm just asking out of curiosity, who was a part of that, of the students who were like in that committee or talking group? So we had the past president, Razan. Um, we had another past president, Karen. We had Chizoba, who was the girl who was in the class. Um, we had CSOs, some CSO representatives as well. And we had ethno and ethno-cultural services, um, um, Mubashra also there as well. So they, they were the students kind of directly involved with the working group and the whole like, like birth of it. Okay. So then with this letter that you recently put out, um, there's a few things on there that you're calling for. So the first one is uh, basically you're asking for Western to be a safe and welcoming space um, for black students and for all students of color, I'm, I'm inferring. Um, so in, in what ways has Western not felt like a safe and welcoming space for, for you guys um, from your personal experience? Personally, for me, I think it's just a lack of representation of Black people in higher areas in the USC. There's no people of color. And I know um, a few years ago, we did have a Black president. But it's like, what happens is that it's always you have one Black person, and then years of no Black people, years of just, you don't see any color. And then they'll have another one that are like, oh my gosh, diversity, that's so good. And then again, years of nothing. So that just kind of discouraged me. And even um, being on res too, just like the kind of language I encounter, the kind of things people said to me, the microaggressions I face, like people touching my hair and knowing that like that is not okay, but they obviously don't know anything. And when I spoke to my RA about it, they were like, oh yeah, like he just doesn't know or she just doesn't understand, like like very little um, re repercussions for like certain actions. That's kind of what I found that Western didn't make me feel comfortable. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Like from my personal experience, um, and especially from like not growing up in like a predominantly white neighborhood, I felt that Western generally for me, everywhere I went, every faculty I've been to, every place or every space I've been to that I was on campus had like what I would call like a racist undertone or like a racial, racially biased undertone, okay. right? Where you literally couldn't even run into anybody from the school who wasn't making prejudices about you by like by how you looked, right? Every friend you might make who's white, especially when you first meet them, will definitely say some ignorant like, BS. Like what? Right? Like people, I don't know, like, how do I explain this? If if you're a black person and you have white friends, right, there's a plethora of things they don't know about you and will never understand about you, mm -hmm. right? And so it'll shine through in the way they interact with you, right? Mm. And that is just friends. When it comes to things like faculty, right, mm. it's just that much worse. They don't know you, you're just some random black kid. They'll treat you like a random black kid in their eyes, right? And even from past alumni that I've talked to who went to Western, they come back and they still say, yeah, that racial undertone, still there, mm -hmm. still very clear. You still feel it. Do you know what I mean? You know you're a minority. You walk into a room. I'm the black person in this room right now, right? You have mm -hmm. to sound extremely articulate. Like even right now, this is kind of like my regular, I don't know, speaking voice where I'm comfortable. But you go into a white space and you have to be as articulate as you possibly can. Do you yeah. know what I mean? Because you know they'll make, they'll, they'll make, you know, judgments about you based on how you present race, yourself yeah. do you know what i mean mm -hmm. that's what it's like at western being a black student do you know what i mean you're always mm -hmm. checking yourself you're always making sure you're not doing the most being too loud 
you know, sounding ignorant, asking a dumb question, any of that. It goes on and on and on and on, and it's constant. You know what I mean, that's, that's honestly just the surface too. Sometimes you'll literally hear things that are completely offensive, but just act like it's not. Do you know mm-hmm. what I mean? Especially if you're working in a group for a project, if you're talking to a professor in office hours, they'll say things that you're kind of just like, you know, I don't know how I felt about that, but you kind of just accept and you move on with your day. Do you know what I mean? So like, you know, that's, that's just what my personal experience was. I don't know if it's, if that's, if that's for everybody, but I feel like I'm a, I'm perceptive enough to realize when like those, and like, it's not like I completely blame them. I, now I will blame them because, you know, it's obvious now. But mm-hmm. before it was kind of just like people just don't know better. You know what I mean, like, like the ignorance is, is real and it was for a very, very long time. Yeah, for um, for me, I definitely benefit from being biracial and having lighter skin tone. Um, and I can tell that, especially with my personality, too, I'm very outspoken as it is. So I don't feel uncomfortable in class to speak out. And I definitely have over my um, darker skin friends, I definitely have a privilege to speak out when things are necessary. I've called out teachers before. I have no issue doing that. Um, I necessarily don't feel it for me. I haven't had anything ignorant um, or teachers being maybe not calling on me or questioning when I ask them a question and that I've always had teachers that were very open to listening to what I had to say. Um, but that's definitely, I think my skin color, my background definitely plays a role into that. However, I have heard from other people and I've seen other people's experiences from my point of view, kind of being, I feel like I'm almost kind of like the gatekeeper from both. I balance both, um, both white and black in that sense. So I can see the interactions, whether or not I experience them myself, but I definitely have seen, um, it's just very ignorant comments from people. And I feel like Western, for sure, I 100% echo Joey with the racial um, like undertone. Um, it's almost people, like I, I actually challenged a close friend the other day and no clue this guy had these views that he did um, until I actually really pushed him on it. Mm-hmm. And then I got how he really felt. So. I think it's it's mostly like that. Like they're very nice to your face, mm. um, very PC, um, play play along to get along. But when you're not there, you definitely get it. And I, being I feel like a gatekeeper, especially in the white community to the black community, I definitely get the benef- benefit of um, hearing these ignorant comments, but they feel comfortable saying it around me, mm. right? Because they think I'm gonna let it slide. Or because, oh, I'm halfway, I might agree with them. Do you know what I mean? I definitely mm-hmm. feel those in those situations. That's more my experience where they'll say something ignorant um, about Black people. And then they think I'm just going to, like, stand there and not say anything. Mm-hmm. But, yeah, I haven't personally, I don't think, experienced, at least that I was able to consciously recognize was racism or um, a microaggression or micro insult. But I've definitely seen other students experience it for sure. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I mean, like, personally, I feel like we've all had white friends who said the N word. Like, you can't oh. be a black student at Western <laughs> and have not had one of your friends, like That's friends, terrible. literally say the yeah. N word to you and That's defend terrible. it with their whole might. I mean, exactly. <laughs> this was the thing that just blew my mind with the whole situation that happened last year with Chizoba, like when that happened. You know, I was hearing white people like fight with their life for their right to be able to use the n-word and it's like why do you even want to use it that bad you know Mm -hmm. why it's literally one one word you (laughs) don't have to say and do you know what it was used for like do you know what it means if if i mean like when you're born privileged and entitled like you assume that you have the right to do anything you want exactly Mm -hmm. exactly when you're born born, um with no one telling you no ever it's just going to make you do want something more when you're told no, even as a child, because um, a lot of these people have ch- child mentality. Um, when you say no to a child, they just want to do it all, all the more, much more, you know, mm-hmm. um, which is really like, wow, unfortunate to see. And it was even what was more disturbing to me about that is people defending it in an academic sense. Oh, oh yeah. Academic freedom. To be able to do this and blah, blah, blah. And it, and that we addressed that in the letter, um, the part that like I wrote in uh, collaboration with um, uh, some of the execs, 
was I was saying like for this to be covered under academic freedom and I honestly wish I had said it was a eugenics argument Mm -hmm. um that was his entire um tenure at western was a eugenics argument you're you're talking about the um rush rushton right philip rushton yeah Yeah. i'm gonna put that under academic freedom i just found absolutely disgusting and as a tenure i know you are on a contract and you can't really fire them but i'm sure there if if not there should be something in there that says if you do anything out of pocket like that you need to go Mm-hmm. And the fact that he was disdained, like, you know, worldwide for his things and Western to this day has not given an acknowledgement. I can understand maybe not an apology because I know um, when they uh, really admit it, they are, they open themselves up to a lawsuit um, for many people. So I can see maybe why they, they haven't, but even to acknowledge or, or separate themselves from him, I haven't even seen that. Like, um, you know, so it's kind of disgusting to see, but I find especially white people, they will defend with their whole heart um, the use of that. And they're so hypocritical. I mean, don't get me started on that. But um, yeah, it's just very disgusting to see and it's very unfortunate, um, especially when they like to use, Western likes to use us in their ads. And oh my God. Of course. We're, yeah, it's a diversity yeah. campaign. Diversity campaign. We're in the ads, we're on the website, but <laughs> you have the most racist a person in your institution and you felt no need to distance yourself from that person and you made excuses for that and that's the issue when we have people in power making excuses for people who make these eugenics racist xenophobic sexist i can go on list of these things they need to be held accountable because people won't do things if they know they can't get away with it Mm -hmm. all right so that's the issue i was actually speaking to one of western's admin and they were talking, I was bringing up the idea of bring, have, make, having an apology for the Russian situation. And someone told me that the reason they can't do that is because, or not that they can't do it, but they're afraid to do it is because they're scared it's going to give white supremacists a platform. What? Where, like, what? where did that come from? I, I was so shocked that she could even say that to me because she's like, yeah, like, we're just scared that if we bring light to it now, it's going to bring people to praise his work. There's ways of apologizing to yeah. at your school without even getting into detail about what he did, you know, and they're just using, they're bringing up any single excuse they can just to get away from the issue. And they're hiding behind this blanket of, okay, yeah, we're just at least doing something. Even if we're not addressing it specifically, we're indirectly, you know, solving the problem. And if we talk to the BSA or if we talk to this and that, they're going to be like, yeah. oh, wow, Western's doing so much. And I want to just say, like, I do appreciate all that they're doing, but it's, yeah. it's not just saying something and posting something. It's actually, like, doing it. Actually, like, the call to action, actually making a difference. So, yeah, that's something that we had a problem with as well. And with Western, Western loves to talk about racism, but general racism. They never want to go specifically yes. to Black racism, um, a, a white professor um, talking rudely to a black student or saying the n-word to a black student and like Sydney said all in the name of academic freedom academic freedom should not warrant you to be racist like this is what these people think it's it doesn't even make any single sense and making excuses 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 for this issue yeah they're mm-hmm. using racial neutral language is the official term for what they're doing is there i we always argue about this right but when black people ask for something we're asked to share the spotlight mm. right even with the new term that's been coined during this thing, B-I-P-O-C, it's Black Indigenous People of Color. And it's like everything we do. I'm um, not going to lie. I had no idea what that meant for the longest time. Okay, there you go. <laughs> that's what it is. It's Black Indigenous people, people of Color. They at least separated Black and Indigenous um, from that experience because people of color um, do, in a, in a way, in the hierarchy of being on the bottom, there is still a hierarchy on the bottom. And mm-hmm. unfortunately, Indigenous Black people rank the lowest. So um, it is unfortunate to see, and you know, we are asking for certain spaces and stuff. And I just feel like when we ask for things, it's always like, oh, general racism or blah, blah, blah. You know, they made the working group, so it includes everyone. It's like, we can never ask for something personally, but um, the indigenous students have their own room. They have their own counselors. They have their own people, do you know what I mean? Not to discredit what they go through, their um, community has gone through because it's absolutely horrific and they definitely do don't need those resources. But I feel like for the rest of the people of color, especially black people, we're asked to just fend for ourselves. Mm-hmm. And anytime we ask for something, there's an excuse after excuse after excuse and it's kind of tiring 
having to um, ask for things we rightfully deserve mm -hmm. and um, that we actually need in our community, you know? So it's kind of upsetting. For sure. And I feel like too, um, a lot of organizations and higher powers always look at different groups before they look at black people. So like, mm -hmm. uh, not to uh, disassociate like um, the LGBTQ community from black oh, yes. people, but like even that, when that whole thing was, when it was um, illegal to have same sex marriage in the U S it didn't take too much for them to get to where they have to go. Like, obviously they've been through things. I'm not, I'm not um, discrediting the, what happened, but all I'm saying is that like um, their protests, there was no machine guns. There was no nothing. Mm -hmm. The women's protests, there was no nothing, but you're forgetting that there are black people in these groups as well. And like, it's like a lot of people are like, okay, yeah, we, we support LGBTQ people. But when we look at black LGBTQ people or when we look at black women, it's like, oh my gosh. They're still at the bottom. Right. Yeah, they're still at the and bottom. Let's, let's remember who got the, uh, the LGBT community, LGBTQ2 plus community their rights. In Stonewall, okay. who was writing? Black queer woman and black woman right? And transgender black women. It was the black woman standing in solidarity with the LGBTQ2 plus community, right? And getting, we were fighting for their rights. The Women's March, black people fought for those rights. And it's just really upsetting to then see um, white feminists and a lot of, there is racism within the LGBTQ community. Let's keep it 100. Mm -hmm. they, there is a hierarchy. Black trans women are killed the most out of all trans women in the community, right? So just to see that like we fought to get them where they are. And um, you know, that's great. They deserve the rights they have today. No one's taking that away from them. But it just seems like black people are always supporting others. We're always there for others, but we have to do things by ourselves. When it's our so turn to silence. Yeah. To get, get the things. But when it comes to other people, we stand by them every time. Coronavirus, who is speaking out the most? Black women. And then to have the audacity of some people in the Asian community to, um, de just like not justify our protest for freedom. It's absolutely like the hi hypocrisy is insane. So it just right. it really feels like you know being at the bottom of the totem pole. You fight for everyone, but when it's time to for you to get your fair share, and you know, um, it, no one's there to be found. Like I'm the women's march. I'm looking for the women, the white feminists especially. Where are you at these protests? They're not there. I'm Where are honest. you? Black people, we're lucky. We should be lucky that the black community don't want revenge. That, like, he's gonna speak. He's we should be lucky, or they should. They yeah. should be lucky. Grateful. They should be lucky that we lucky. don't want revenge. We're just asking for simple equity and justice. Like, <laughs> yes. it's not like. <laughs> so you should be helping us. We're not trying to come. In, we're not trying to come do anything to you. We're trying to have rights. This is basic rights that we are being denied yeah. constantly and constantly. Why are we shouting? Why are we fighting for basic rights that every human should have? It's just, it's very I mean, on, on, the, on, the, on the bright side, though, like, we're finally in the spotlight, you know? And, like, even yeah. with, like, the, the U.S. elections happening, like, you know, in the next five or five or six months, like, there's no doubt in my mind that the Black agenda is going to be the agenda for the next president. It better right? be. And so I want to, I wanna, I'm excited to see what will actually happen. I don't know, I don't know about Joe Biden or if he's even capable of doing, like, you know, anything that makes sense, but I know that there's, like, <laughs> A ton of other politicians that are actually fully on board and you know brands are on board like companies are on board people are on board like we just have to optimize you know what i mean and like we're mm -hmm. we're now in a position where we can have like a zero tolerance towards ignorance because i know mm -hmm. me personally i've been zero tolerance towards <laughs> ignorance anywhere like i shut it down yeah. completely because by now you have to know and there's always those like random kids that want to give you the most basic fact like oh yeah like the prison population is like has like 30 percent black people right it's like hey if you are still going to tell me the same facts that have, been refuted, that have been refuted on the internet over and over and over and over and over again, you're just clearly uneducated. You're, you're, you're just refusing to actually look at the facts. Mm -hmm. You just want to say something that's like racially charged. Do you know what I mean? Because yeah. at this point, I've seen so many videos on the prison system, the incarceration rates, the like, it, like wealth right. gap. Every, I've seen it all. I've learned way more about my own people in the past like three weeks that I have my entire life. If you if you haven't mm -hmm. caught up by now and you want to tell me the same basic information that's clearly untrue, you're just you're just uneducated. So I, I have to shut it down. It's like I'm, I'm just gonna say like you don't know what you're talking about. Conversation's over. I'm moving <laughs> on now. Yeah, like, that's just what's, what it's gonna be. And then, and we're gonna we're gonna see change and you know we'll keep moving from there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um. 
so to bring it back to your letter, uh, we talked about a lot of these different points so far, such as the staff lacking the basic knowledge and, um, uh, you know, sympathy, I guess, in to relate to, or at least to like check themselves when they're dealing with uh, their student, students of color and especially black students. Um, you talk about having a more diverse staff. So more TAs, um, counselors, yeah. people working in the USC, mm -hmm. uh, people working in residence. Um, and a call to action to improve Western's anti-racism policy. So what exactly does an anti-racism policy look like at the university? Is it dealing with disciplinary measures? Is it dealing with education measures? What does the anti-racism policy ideally look like? I don't even think we have one. And right now we're working, like that's what the president's working yeah. on getting one because I couldn't even tell you. I couldn't even um, tell you what to I do. think a policy though, it's looking at tackling from student to student we need one for professor to student. We need one for professor to professor. There's multi-levels, multi right? Like racism is such a broad definition in itself. You can't throw it into a one two page policy, right? So I think what we're asking particularly is to have accountability for certain actions and have um, it laid out. Like we need a separate section in that policy for black students. We need a separate section in that policy for indigenous students. We need a separate policy for Asian students. There is a categorical, like there needs to be separate because it's different measures, it's right? Different, yeah. And what when um racism in general, yeah, the broad technique we all experience it. Um, you know, I mean non white people non white people, but um, when you look at the racism that black people face for the racism Asian people face, that's completely different. There are so many minute details that differentiate, right? So overall, though, we should have a governance policy that meet that for us, I think it's very obvious and very easy. If you speak, you have hate speech, you act on racist ideals, or you are inciting or encouraging or allowing racism and ignorance in your classroom, you should be reprimanded. And I think there needs to be a system in place for that. I don't think you should get your job, your, you should get fired for ignorant comments. However, I think you need to be reprimanded because like Joey was saying, we're in 2020. I'm sorry, you have Google, you have YouTube, you see it on the news every day. Like, come on, by now, if you didn't know, Sit, calling black people the n-word was racist i'm so sorry you need to be fired do you know what i mean so i think there needs to be multi levels and multi um potential results and examples for different scenarios we can help map that out um for sure and i know other clubs can as well for their own um individual people but i think there needs to be they can't put a blanket policy that's just something we don't want. If they're going to throw out a racism policy that's for everyone, it's not going to work. And I'm going to tell them right now it's not going to work. Because there's so many different scenarios and categories, different actions fall into. You can't just say, oh, racism, you're, you did something racist, you should be fired. That's not, like, that doesn't apply for everything. Do you know what I mean? So we definitely need, it's a very complex um, policy. They can reference other universities, I'm sure, that have one. Um, so I don't think it's like that hard. It is very challenging maybe to arrange it, but they have the resources out there to complete it. So you're expecting to see one, um, sooner than later. Yeah. Like what I would, what I would want to see as a black student are those same resources being fully used towards black students to make sure that they feel like they're safe when they go into certain spaces. Um, the policy has to include like the fact that certain things just can't happen anymore. Do you know what I mean? Like hate speech can't happen. There's no reason the N-word should be used in any class whatsoever. Do you know what I mean? Like mm -hmm. training has happened for some of these professors, staff, the entire thing. And, you know, there, there needs to be some sort of way for, for black students and, you know, students of color and so on to hold these professors accountable. Do you mm -hmm. know what I mean? Like professors need to be held accountable by students because we're the ones that experienced it. And we're the ones who need to be heard in these times. You know what I mean? And I don't want to feel like I can experience something racist in a classroom and I'm not going to get heard. Because even for Chizoba, it took so long for her to get to actually, you know, speaking to the USC that that can't keep happening because I know she's not, she's not even the only one. There's, there was many other instances where students experienced that they knew wasn't right 
and the people around them knew it wasn't right, but there was no way to say, you know, to the school, like this happened, this is wrong, this needs to be fixed. Do you know what I mean? If the school's mm -hmm. listening, then the policy will be made the way it should be made. Do you know what I mean? Like they, this needs to be a way to like have that student voice be heard through that policy rather than just like a school writing another blanket statement to people, please. Do you know what I mean? It's not gonna do anything. And like what recently happened, like I said before, is, is real change. Yeah. yeah, we actually, in our letter and to the Equity, diversi Diversity, and Inclusion Coordinator, we did suggest actually having a mind map, almost like, I, I almost compared it to um, when you're a kid, you go into Seventeen Magazine, you have a quiz, and it's like, A, you're an optimist, B, you're, right, <laughs> and it's like, yes or no, you go here, yes or no. I said, we need that for racism, because even thinking of my own experience, I don't know who I would go to if I experienced a racist thing. Do you know what I mean? At Western. No idea. And mm -hmm. like, and they don't even know when we talk to them, they, it stops at a certain level. So I think even just having a basic, like almost like a mind map, it's like you, the student on student, did this happen? Yes or no. You go here if it's yes, you go here if it's no. And just being able to even have one level to just refer students to so that that person can now refer you to other people right? That would just make it so much easier. Um, and from there, they can record data like they're doing with the anti-working group, get feedback, and then maybe create a policy off of that based on how these interactions are going or where the needs are not met. Um, just even something as simple as that um, would be great. But yeah, I think now Western and a lot of universities and even institutions need to be held accountable for their lack of policies and attention to these issues. Um, because I'm not paying $10,000 a year to uh, incur um, racist experiences mm -hmm. at my school. I'm here to learn. I just want to be a student. I don't have, I don't want to have to worry about my race when I walk into a, a room or situation, a class. I just want to be able to sit down and learn and not be like, oh no, we're talking about police brutality today. I hope, yeah. you know. And like everyone I, looks behind you and watches you exactly, and stares at you in class. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. I want the I want to know at least, uh, as, we have, uh, free speech so you know people in my class can say what they need to say but I want to know that if something's out of pocket my professor will check that person I need you need with that power balance especially we need allies in upper parts of western especially our teachers the people we rely on for grades mm -hmm. and everything to back us up in scenarios and be educated on them themselves mm -hmm. so they can uh, adequately address um, any issues that arise mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I totally agree. And I think one, one thing that I've noticed that is like just wrong is like with the case of Chizoba, again, the university's public statement to her is I think symbolic of how a lot of just society at large sort of deals with these kinds of scenarios, which is like they put her up or they put, you know, the, the, the victim, um, we'll call up as like this heroic, brave, courageous person but yeah. they do not at all talk about who did the wrongdoing and reprimand them for doing the wrongdoing. Like there was no, you know, like she was getting emails, um, her email flooded with all this spam of people, you know, and a lot of them were probably students, maybe students who knew her, you know, with just the N word. And um, it's like, you know, she, she she did what she had to do. She stood up for, you know, herself and she saw, she called out a professor for doing something wrong. But, uh, you know, it's, she's not a, a hero for doing that. You know, that's kind of just like a basic, that's what anybody should do, mm -hmm. regardless of whether or not they're implicated in that in some way. That's just what anybody should do. So instead of it's like, oh, you know, this heroic, brave person, it's like, well, what about the people who did the wrongdoing and, you know, calling them out for being wrong you know what i'm saying mm -hmm. yeah like there's there's no repercussions and like i i commend her for for doing what she did because like it feels like she was the first do you know what i mean and it just goes to show how like there is like that sort of fear that you can't even say anything and it's kind of messed up that like yeah. we think that way but like in a lot of students eyes like she is a hero because a lot of you know like black students or, or students of color are now becoming passive because they don't want to seem like they're that that angry black kid in their friend yeah. group, or they're, they're like that political all the time. Because even among my friends, and most of my friends are people of color, like they see me sometimes as like 
always political, always thinking about like, you know, like the like like our our issues, and like I wasn't always like that, but like I now have to be like that. We have to be like that because like these things are affecting us more and more by the day. Do you know what I mean? As, as we get older, and we eventually graduate, go into the real world, these issues we don't have to deal with all the time. It's not just like um you know once in a while type of thing. Do you know what I mean? And so like yeah, like like she 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 did what she had to do because like it's just it just it is what it, it is what it is and um you know that's that was the first step in finally getting the repercussions that we will mm -hmm. that we will soon see in the future mm -hmm. yeah and like i me and angie too we like personally know chizoba and i know she's quite shy so that was a lot for her to come out and do that that took a mm -hmm. lot of her um especially in her final year being coming out and doing the interviews on the news and she was just like really overwhelmed she i don't say she didn't speak out about it but she was, she's more conserved for sure. Mm -hmm. So for her to come on and do that was really honestly like, a, like shout out to her. That was really, yeah, very really impressive. Amazing. And, if and on, she is a hero. I think she's a, like, it, it, it speaks for it a, lot a lot of people to do because that. yeah, she is a hero. And another thing with speaking out, I, I, it just fails to, I fail to understand why people have such a problem with black people standing up for themselves. Yeah. We do not hate white people. We don't like hate other people of color. We are standing up for ourselves. You're going to call me the N-word. I'm not going to say anything. Like, what do people actually expect? <laughs> mm -hmm. You're getting angry. Like, you're getting angry. We're fighting against discrimination. This is a bad thing. You still want this to be in the world? And this is when I see, even just to stem off of what we're seeing in the world, with the protests, all these racists coming out, people doing blackface. What are you doing it for? Sit in your house. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mind your own business. This I is not a bad thing. We're trying to live our lives. Like, we do you think we really want to be doing this? I don't want to be posting every single day about black rights. I don't want to have to be reminded every single day that I might die because of the color of my skin. I don't want to keep doing this. But I even know some of my friends are like, oh my God, is Andrew still like white people now that she's talking about black people? What? Like, yeah, like I, I have friends think, saying that. They're like, yo, like you don't like white people anymore? It's like, what are you talking about? <laughs> I'm asking for like you to stop, like, what? Like, no, nah, it's, it's just, it's ridiculous. Like, we don't, we don't want to be always, like, mm -hmm. upset or, like, always, like, you know, like, hurting or always having to deal with these issues because, like, for the most part, they're not fun. Do you know what I mean? Like, yeah, and like having to fight looking, all the time, it's not, like, what I want to be doing with my time. Yeah, and even looking, just hearing their experiences, I already see my um, privilege in that because I've actually had the absolute opposite. I've had people coming to me being like, thank you for doing this. I know you've been posting when this wasn't a trend. Uh, you're educating me. I've had um, white people from my school reach out to me, my high school and elementary mm -hmm. school, encouraging me to keep going. So mm -hmm. even like just the difference in tone that I'm receiving versus Joey and Angie mm -hmm. and like the perception is absolutely crazy. And that's why it is essential for um, lighter skinned people, especially, and especially white people to speak up when these issues happen, because and use, your privilege, um, yeah. use your privilege, like speak out because people want to listen to people that look like them. If we're being honest, mm -hmm. because you can relate, you know? So when, um, you know, when you see like, oh, like Celine Dion and like all these people, Justin Bieber posting about, you know, I love Billie Bob Eilish. I know Billie that shook so many people. Exactly. Exactly. And it reached her fans. And you know what? They'll listen to Billy before they listen to me. So <laughs> that's why we need our, our allies to come out and speak because mm -hmm. there is a privilege even within just speaking out, you know, I, and you know, you have to really be cognizant and you don't feel this way or see it until someone either shoves it in your face or you do experience it every day. And I can't blame people for not, if you don't experience, you'll never know. I can't blame but mm -hmm. I can hold you accountable for not educating yourself when times do, you know? Um, and they're lucky. We have, we just started. Police brutality is the tip of the iceberg. You want, we can hit you with healthcare, education. Like there's so many categories that black people are discriminated against. So when people say to me, like, I believe people say, oh, well, it's not, it's almost over, isn't it? What do you mean it's almost over? We're just <laughs> getting started. You're lucky we're picked the most blatant discrimination because even the next down, I'd say it's healthcare and economics. And we haven't even touched that yet. We're just getting started. I haven't started. even touched it. I haven't even touched yeah. it. And black people are just taking off right now. We the are- job market, actually, like, access to opportunities, mm -hmm. like all of that. It's such, it's such yeah. from, from since when you're a kid, like it just, the yeah. whole, like your whole, all society, you know? And like mm -hmm. the sad truth is, is like, 
when we say these things, it's like we're speaking a different language. They just mm-hmm. don't, they don't, they don't understand. You know what I mean? They think we're exaggerating. Oh, really? they, they, they literally think that we're like, we're making this stuff up. And it's like, no, dude. Like, when I apply for a job, I make like 30 different resumes. I'm going in. Mm-hmm. Like you, you tried once, you got the interview. I remember, I remember when I was, this is a personal story. I remember when I was in high school, right? And me and Josh and one of my white friends, Devin, did this thing called DECA, right? And me and Josh busted our balls trying to get to the top right and we worked so hard to the point where we ended up training our friend our white friend you know a little bit helping him out especially especially josh to like you know you know do what we're doing right when i tell you we barely got to like the the like provincials and this white kid got all the way like it was like a clear representation of like, the difference do you know what i mean like you can you can say the exact same thing to people in the exact same way so i'm professional and as logical as possible and they just won't hear you do you know what i mean mm-hmm. that's why we need allies that's what we need these people to say it in their language to say like no like this isn't about black people exaggerating how much they're being brutalized this is about human beings our nation like our country people being attacked by the system that brought them here in the first place because they didn't even ask to be here exactly I mean, but like, like this is, is not this up is for is. debate. This mm-hmm. is what I don't understand. Why is this up for debate? It's clear. It's here. So what are we doing about it? Why are we still debating 400 years later? You know, we should have this right. Or even when people are like, oh, in America, you know, you're disrespecting the flag. Your constitution literally says in it, we are three fifths of a person. Your anthem is a song that was created by white supremacists and slave owners. Why would I respect that? Mm-hmm. Honestly, though. Mm-hmm. You know, you're lucky I even follow the laws in this country. Yeah, you know? and, and in all honesty, too, with, with the whole kneeling and the flag thing, it's like, like, yo, this is a protest. How are you going to tell me when to protest? I'm mm-hmm. sorry, should I protest on, on Sunday evening when it's convenient for you, <laughs> even though I'm protesting? Like, uh, it makes zero sense. It, and you it, ask them what to do, and they have no clue. They tell you, oh, don't do this, don't do exactly. that. They say no. Mm-hmm. But then I ask, okay, what is the correct way to get my message across? They're silent. They don't know. They're, they're speaking and they have no, don't talk if you don't have a solution. You know, then you wonder so why weird. riots are happening. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's so irritating, honestly. It's all part of the process though. I mean, like it's, it, started, it started so long ago, especially for like BSA execs. And to see it finally get to this point is a good thing. But, mm-hmm. you know, it's just, yeah. it's just been, there's so many moving parts towards like getting like proper treatment proper change for like black students on campus and um even though it's tiring it's still it still feels important just because like there's so much to to still be done Mm -hmm. yeah i would say i would say that this is definitely a game changer and it's definitely like as you're saying it's now these issues are front and center of everywhere um black people have the ear of just about everybody maybe not donald trump but um, pretty much like all of the major corporations worldwide, um, all of the major brands, the entertainment industry, the music industry, uh, and down to like the local level, you know, here in London, there's been a total outpour of support. I'm not sure about where the cities where you guys are in right now, but like everywhere, <laughs> Angie's like, oh, <laughs> <laughs> um, hey. Well, there's like four businesses where you're at anyway. So. <laughs> um, but yeah, and, and this is like, I, I feel like the main reason that it's all popping off right now is not because the killing of George Floyd was anything new or shocking to the world, you know, unfortunately, um, because that's been going on, you know, as a tipping point for years. Um, but I think it's mostly to do with how it's spread over social media and, you know, that it just kept being shared and kept being shared. And it also happened like right after Breonna Taylor was murdered and right after Ahmaud Arbery was murdered. So Amy it was Cooper. just like, yeah. Amy and then the Cooper. whole Aaron incident. Oh my goodness. Yeah. And even there's other incidents, there's other incidents too. Like there was a woman who killed her son and blamed it on two black men and you were caught on camera. She tried what? twice, by the way. She threw him into a lake. The, then the um, neighbors or whatever pulled him out. She couldn't kill him the first time. He's autistic, unfortunately. I guess she just didn't want to take care of him. She shoved him in the second time into the lake. He drowned, unfortunately died, rest in peace. And then she co- reported it to the um, police 
saying black people, blah, blah, blah. The other day, my mom actually yesterday went to Service Oak, Ontario to get her license fixed. And the server, clerk three, um, decided <laughs> to be rude and belligerent and, and tell people it's closing time. We don't, we're not taking any people. And people were holding in line a spot for a black man who had been waiting the longest. They said, you go first, right? And she took it upon herself to not only threaten to call the police on him, but call the police on my mother for saying that she needs to cut the disrespect, really. And the police were called. And this is another thing, you know, the police are not at these people's, they are at these people's service, but they shouldn't be. The police are not your, the number you call to run your personal agenda. They're there to, you know, make sure the community is safe. And unfortunately, white people especially feel emboldened to call the police on black people as their personal protection and security agency. And it's not. And there needs to be, again, on the systemic level, repercussions for that. They should be fined. And luckily, the Amy Cooper law in the states, or whatever state that's going to be put in, I think New York, um, mm -hmm. Andrew Cuomo, the governor, said that's unacceptable. And they're putting in a law. If you call the police for your personal agenda for unnecessary things, mm -hmm. you will be fined. And I think that's what needs to be done. And shout out to him. He's a great governor. But um, that, need, that needs to happen everywhere, you know, that the police are not, because white people know, know that the police is there to support them, you know. Mm -hmm. um, they know if they call the police on a black man, they know what's going to happen. Mm -hmm. They know, even if they started the attack, the black man's going to get asked first. So it's really unfortunate to see, and white people know these systems are biased. We know it's biased. So where's the, where's the repercussions? Where's the change? Because everyone knows, whether they want to say it or not, they know, even if it's, they belong on their side, they help them out, that's still an issue, right? Mm -hmm. um so yeah, yeah I, I don't i don't know i don't know if you heard but i remember seeing like um a post on social media where like i think a new york cop was like oh yeah like we're tired of being treated like animals and thugs like you should respect us right and i was like yo i love <laughs> to see this i love this yeah how does it feel to be treated like an animal and a thug for no reason they don't know you yeah. they've never seen you, you before reason to be upset at them but now you're labeled you're 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 vilified for no reason. I want you to remember that feeling whenever you see a black man. I want you to remember that. You know what I mean? Like, and these and all these these cops looking like 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 with dunce hats on, all lined up. Like, yeah, we're we're so upset. We're being labeled like animals and thugs. It's like you got like. I, I think we be stronger. Like, I, it's just crazy. Yeah, and I mean, I think what the police need to do, especially those cops who are you know not on who are you know are not racist or not whatever i mean like you you may not be racist you may not you know think that you need to brutalize um a black person at the scene of wherever you're called but that uh, then you need to be on the stage you know with the organizers of these protests speaking to the megaphone apologizing on behalf of the institution that you belong to and you know pledging that you will do what you can to make it right you know like mm -hmm. that to me is kind of their only salvation mm -hmm. and like the whole thing is silence if you're silent it's taking the side of the oppressor like silence is complacency complacency i think the word is mm -hmm. so like these people not saying anything we know not not all cops are bad we know this but if you're standing around and you see a cop doing something bad or you know something's bad but you're staying quiet you are, are as bad as that person i mean yeah, like there's, there's, to, oh, sorry. there's like a there's like a difference between knowing like not all cops are bad just like not all people are bad but i feel like they need to recognize that like a, a too many of you are not doing your job do you know what i mean right. i don't care if you've had three hundred thousand good interactions the fact that there's been so many bad, terrible, horrific, traumatizing interactions mm -hmm. proves that the police force itself needs to do a better job. They have work to do. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like, there's many people saying, if you're a doctor, you don't get to just mess up. Do you know what I'm saying? Like, you don't you don't get to just kill a black person, think it's an accident, and move on with your day. Do you know what I mean? Why are no white people being killed by accident? Do you know I mean, why is it so easy towards that? Do you know what I mean like there's there's no excuse anymore it's so blatantly obvious at this point that i can't even sit to hear like oh yeah like not all of us are bad do you know what i mean like it's That's a job it do it right do you know what i mean like how am i gonna go get a job at mcdonald's and be like oh yeah like not all of us are bad employees like no like if there's a bad employee 
you get rid of the employee, you fix the situation, you make up for it. Do you know what I'm saying? That's what you're supposed to do as an institution, as a police force, as a friggin' system put in place to protect and serve the people. If you're not serving the people, what are you doing? Mm-hmm. Yeah, and even you can see, um, I honestly, I don't want to say I feel bad for the police, but I can um, find compassion with police officers who don't want to speak up because you see what happens to people when they speak up. These mm-hmm. police, officers, even in Toronto, if you look at Toronto police, there's currently a case going on about sexual harassment. They settled with two of the women. One of the women is fighting. She, when she reported her harassment from her mentor, she was in a shootout, called for backup. No one came. They mm-hmm. abandoned her because that was their message. Police are very us versus everyone else, you know? Mm-hmm. And they have to be. They're, it's a safety thing, right? But they take it to an extreme. And it's the institutions, the police culture, the toxic culture um, within the police that needs to be fixed. Um, unfortunately, the police can only do so much on the lower level. And I, I know not everyone has the... Um, the privilege to speak out because you could potentially lose your job. If you're supporting a family, you know, you need that job. You're not going to say anything and put yourself against your coworkers, against your superiors, because that might stop your job growth. It is a very selfish mindset, but not everyone can be a martyr for their, um, for the cause. Do you know what I mean? Not everyone has the ability to do that, you know? So that's why we need these institutions, the policymakers, the people on top, to design the culture that the workplace culture that needs to be in it. Do you know what I mean? Because if the top, if the police chief says, this is unacceptable, anyone in here who acts against it is getting fired. People would act up people or not act up. People would act accordingly, you know? Um, but if the police chief turns a blind eye to it and allows this culture to continue, you cannot blame these officers for not wanting to say anything because even in Buffalo, the officers that pushed the old man, giving them back a helmet, 57 of them in their squadron were, um, like, basically quit. Mm-hmm. And they were outside the courthouse as they were leaving. They were mm-hmm. applauding them outside the courthouse. Mm-hmm. And that was nuts. And, mm-hmm. Yeah, I understand. What Donald Trump said, too? Yeah, yeah he, he said, said, said it was like a set up. Yeah. I cannot believe that. Culture in the service industry, yeah. but it's very sad. It couldn't be more obvious. It was guys, nice. guys, it was, it was on insane. camera. It was on camera. The dude almost died. I don't even know how he's still alive. That guy's, His head split open. That, that guy, that guy, that guy's a tank. That guy's, that guy's a tank. All right. Shout out to that dude. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, guys, I feel like we could go on and on and on about this all night. Um, but we've been talking for about an hour and a half now. Um, <laughs> which is not a bad thing at all. But I do have to hop on another call at nine. And like I said, I really would love to keep this, to keep an ongoing conversation between the BSA and Radio Western. I've told you guys in the past that our airwaves are always open if, if you guys wanted to even have something more regular on there. But at the very least, um, I do want to check white in. People. What's that? They're white people. <laughs> They're white people. Yeah, yeah, for real. Um, but uh, like I said, I do want to check in. Uh, on a somewhat regular basis to see where all this stuff is at Um, and like as time goes on at the university Mm -hmm. and one more thing unless anyone has anything they want to add right now I think we got most of the frustration out (laughs) yeah okay Um, one more thing I want to ask you guys to just introduce yourselves as if we were at the top of the interview because I forgot to ask you to do that at the beginning we just kind of got right into it so um, I guess we'll, we'll start from Angie and you know if you could just give a little introduction about yourself whatever you want to say is, is fine okay um, my name is Angie Antonio I'm a third year neuroscience student and I'm currently the president of BSA Western um, hi, my name is Sydney Joao. I'm a fourth year criminology student at Western, and I'm going to be VP events this year. Hi, I'm Joey. I'm a currently a third year uh, student in BMOS, and I'm the BSA's political affairs officer. Cool. Perfect. Welcome, guys. <laughs> <laughs> now, bye, guys. No, I'm just kidding. But um. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and Joey, I will get back to you um, and your brother soon about how, what we're going to do with uh, the show. How often are you guys putting out episodes? Uh, so we do it every, uh, every two weeks on Friday night. 
Yeah, okay, just cool. so we don't we don't burn out or anything. Yeah. Yeah, yeah it's a lot. Yeah, give a quick turnover. Sure. And it, it's actually so good. Like it's actually good. <laughs> I know. I it's heard fun. It. It's fun. Like we're kind of like we're trying to ease you guys into like kind of like me and Josh's music taste, just because mm-hmm. uh, I don't want to start with anything too weird. But um, <laughs> <laughs> the next episode, I feel like people will like because I feel like people people are starting to like kind of be more open minded to listen to like different kinds of music. Mm-hmm. So I think you guys will uh will enjoy the next one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think it'd be great. Um, so when you guys do that, just also email me the the mp3 of the mix um and then i'm gonna see when i can put it there's a lot of i'm gonna guess there's gonna be some because the, the last episode i heard it was there was some cussing and it was some there's some dirty lyrics oh yeah we could probably make a clean version and send it to you if you don't yeah because we're not allowed to play any dirty lyrics between 6 a.m and 9 p.m it's such a drag that's why i'm what? moving my show yeah <laughs> that, that, but as our license depends on it so but that's why i'm moving my show to an over to like later on in the night i mean I can't clean up lyrics. We might like, be open to doing like an like a late night show too, because like we're kind of like an yeah. after hours kind of vibe. That's the thing. It's not. Yeah, yeah that's yeah. that's the thing. It it is an after hours type of show, so that's why I would just put you guys on in, the, in an overnight anyway. Sounds good. Yeah, Hi. yeah. Okay, so we'll be in touch. Um, I'll let you know when this goes to air. Yeah. Ho- I'm hoping for this Thursday, but I I'm not sure. It might be next Thursday. Um, but regardless, I'll let you know. Can I just ask this Radio Western 949? That's yes. what it is? Yes. Okay, because I'm going to post 4. it. 4.9 Radio Thanks, Western. Thanks, girl. <laughs> 94.9. Watch or what is it? Like, wait for this or check it out. I'm like all lost for words. I don't know how to speak correctly anymore for some reason. What are you trying to say? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Well, <laughs> tune in. Uh, yeah, like tune in, tune in or like expect tune in sometime. soon. Coming yeah, like, soon. Yeah. yeah Watch like the that. space. <laughs> Yeah. Should I should I tag you like your personal account? Um, you can tag me, and you can also tag Radio Western's account too. Okay. Which I'm guessing so you already did. I just said Radio Western XBSA tune in sometime next week uh-huh. for some for some juicy talks or whatever. What should I say? Juicy talks. Don't put some, uh, <laughs> some insightful insightful conversation. Be yeah. like attention, all white people. <laughs> yeah, dear white people, you should do that. You should do that yeah, yeah our own dear white people episode I, um, I but the funny thing is too though i've all, like dear white people inspired me to join bsa i love that show really? I watched it. Mm-hmm. literally it's so, like, I don't like if we it. ever had a radio station <laughs> called dear white people you ever seen it i saw one episode and i was like what is this maybe i'm, I'm not gonna finish it, finished it. would the bsa be the interested time. in doing like a dear white people type of uh, show but like down. your own I'm spinoff super down yeah. that on the radio inspired me on like the radio, I love, I love the entire energy of like the girl who ran it because she just like literally went like, "Dear white people, this is like what I'm gonna say, and y'all gonna listen to it." And, and like, we're including people of color because I feel like also too all the time we focus on white people and the people of color think they're off the hook. Um, so we definitely want to have like Dear Western or um, something like that. Yeah, Dear mm-hmm. White People, but we'll address POCs in it as well. But yeah, yeah. I'd be so down for that. That's that would be, be fun. super down. Be mad, okay. especially like as the year goes on, things happen in the school. Yeah, yeah. So we could collaborate sure. on topics and like prepare something so it's a little bit more um organized in time. So we're of not course, of course, super over, and we tackle the parts you want to make sure it's like good for you guys if you want to air it. Of um, so but, yeah, uh, I think like podcasting's on the rise too. Do you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Especially like within like my circle, they like to be updated when like things happen. So I'm always kind of just like telling them anyway. So like, if there's like a podcast for like the BSA, like, like yeah. here's what's happening this month at Western, as far as black students, I think yeah. that'd be pretty cool to like listen in. And, and, yeah, yeah, we would be so down for a collab. I think that's definitely yeah. down. We've had a great experience with you and um, the team at Radio Western. So I think we're definitely super open, and we have a new exec team this year as well. A great exec team. Yeah, I think a bunch of newbies. So they, um, they like activated. Uh, yeah <laughs> yeah this year's um especially the um second year um group is very passionate so it'd be great to even get their input onto um into the collaboration and making of maybe an episode or two mm-hmm. and running it that'd be super awesome but we can definitely like um talk about that um, yeah regional or whenever this all maybe calms down a bit <laughs> yeah yeah i'm sure you guys are busy with things as they're going right at this moment 
guys. <laughs> but um, maybe in a few weeks we can touch base and see yeah, definitely. if people have the time to sit down and, and think about the show. Yeah, that'd so, be awesome. I'm okay, super down. Great. great. Yeah, yeah, great. I definitely have space on the grid for that. Perfect. So we'll make it happen. Okay. Well, thanks so much for your time tonight, everyone. I yeah, appreciate it. Was so it. Nice. Oh, yeah. it was nice yeah. talking to you. Yeah, you too. It was fun, yeah. Yeah, you guys too. And you know how to reach me. I'm always on. So, yeah. Yeah, I got the IG. <laughs> That's right. That's right. Okay. Yay, Have a well, good night, guys. You. Yeah, Bye. we'll talk soon. Bye. 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 Take care.